to. Hey, may I squeeze in? Oh, of course. Of course. You know, it's standing room only. Maybe we should be standing also. <laughs> Not to mention, who has time? I have time to go to a lunch right. talk right. to hear what a colleague is right. going to say. Right. Right. But I have every, almost every afternoon. I have an obligation. Sometimes it's good to see stuff, but other times it's not. Let's, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. All right, y'all, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so usually I would do an intro, but I think in the interest of time, and uh, I'm a lot more boring than what we're about to see, we're just going to go ahead and get into this. Um, Professor Munoz, uh, this is Philip Munoz, will be uh, moderating this. He is an associate professor of political science here at Notre Dame. And I'm going to let him do the intros and you know, lead us into it. So we're just going to go ahead and get started, y'all. Thanks for coming. Thank you uh, very much. Again, my name is Philip Munoz. I direct uh, Notre Dame's Constitutional Studies Program. Uh, I'm currently faculty member here at law school. My real home's over in uh, political science. Uh, absolutely thrilled with this turnout uh, for this extraordinary event we have uh, this afternoon. Thank you to uh, Thank you. the ACLU chapter for sponsoring and Chris Cutter uh, for sponsoring and inviting you to participate. Um, we have two very, very distinguished speakers with very long a long list of accomplishments. I'm going to keep it to the bare minimum just to give them more time to speak and you more time to ask them questions. Uh, Josh Blackman is a constitutional law professor at South Texas College of Law. Uh, that's in Houston. Uh, he's the author of two important books, Unravel, Obamacare, Religious Liberty, and Executive Power. That was published in 2016. And then Un Unprecedented, The Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare, came out in 2013. Uh, he regularly provides uh, commentary on constitutional matters in the nation's leading newspapers, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, uh, and other national publications. Uh, Dr. Augustin Fuentes holds the uh, Edmund P. Joyce Chair in Anthropology. Uh, he's one of our most distinguished professors here at Notre Dame, authored more than 100 articles, uh, and last year published an extraordinarily important book uh, that's garnered much attention to create a spark, how imagination made human, humans exceptional. And the format uh, for today's event is as follows. Uh, Professor Blackman will speak for about eight minutes, followed by Dr. Puentes. Uh, and then we'll each have another five minutes uh, to respond to the initial round of comments. Uh, we'll have a little bit of a conversation between the two speakers, and then we'll turn it over to Q&A. The resolution before us is, is there, safe, is there space for safe spaces in free speech. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Blackman. Dr. Blackman, please let us Thank you. Thank you so much. This is my first time at Notre Dame, and what a wonderful turnout, standing room only. So our resolution today concerns safe spaces. And I actually see this as three subsets, three questions. The first is, who gets to decide what speakers can come on campus? The second question is, once the invitation's made, what levels of protest are permissible? And when does that protest become a disruption? And the third question I'd like to address is, if there's a disruption, what should be the role of discipline in that function? Now, usually, when I debate a topic, I can be somewhat objective. Um, this is not one of those topics. Uh, last year, I was invited to speak at the CUNY Law School in Queens. The topic was free speech. And I was protested and shouted down. And I want to play a couple clips from this. You may have seen this on TV. It, it, it made the rounds last year. Uh, I want to play some of the clips of what happened to me uh, last year at CUNY. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the steps this. The Federal Society chapter invites me to talk about free speech. Um, I've never been protested before, and about a couple days before I got to campus, the students told me that they're forming a protest against me. I'm like, really? Why? I'm not that important. Why are they protesting me? <laughs> it's true. I'm, I'm not, worthy of, not worthy of a protest. But I didn't actually believe it would happen. But when I got to school, the security officer said there were about 40 or 50 people in the hallway getting ready to protest you. I'm like, ah, whatever. I didn't really believe it. Maybe. So let me play a clip. This is me walking down the hallway as I'm coming around the, to the room. Yeah, let, me, let me rewind this a tad more.
Okay. Now, so far, so good. <laughs> I mean that. Um, I think there is no problem whatsoever with people protesting outside the room. Let them scream, let them hold signs. If they object to my mere presence on the campus, have at it, right? I actually didn't mind that. That was actually quite comical. In fact, they left their signs on the floor. I actually took them home. I have all the signs. And my favorite sign is hanging on my wall. It says, go home and blog about how hard this is, right? I have a blog, so I have it hanging on my wall. Another sign, which I really like, said, your legal analysis is lazy and wrong. Guilty as charged. <laughs> so I don't have a problem with the protesting outside. And I think in terms of objecting to speakers, what they did was fully reasonable up to this point. Let me keep playing. Now you'll see the room is empty, right? There's no one in there. But there's actually a story behind this that's worth making. A number of students told me afterwards that they were actually embarrassed, afraid to be seen with me, that they wanted to hear what I had to say, but they didn't want to be seen walking in with me. So they actually, the room was empty at the beginning. Later on, that 50 people came in, but they didn't want to be seen with me. Anyway, so, so far, so good. Now, as you can see, I got the sound off, but you can, you can hear what they're saying. The students come around and they surround the perimeter of the room. Not just the back of the room, but the front of the room. And indeed, they're standing as close to Professor Munoz as to me, six inches away right behind me. So this moves to my second question, right? Who gets to decide speakers? This one, I think the answer is very clear, student groups. If student groups make an invitation, then university should allow them to bring that speaker on campus. To CUNY's credit, they didn't disinvite me. They could have uninvited me, and they didn't. So to their credit, they let me come onto the campus. But there's a very ripe debate about whether universities can veto invitations given by student groups. And I think that becomes very problematic, an outright veto. But there are ways of doing the veto that aren't quite as expressed. One way is saying, well, if you want the speaker, that's fine, but you have to pay for security. They think, why does a speaker need security? Well, here at Notre Dame, I feel safe. I don't think any of you are going to harm me. But at CUNY, I was actually quite afraid. Now, I didn't think they would hurt me, but when you have a dozen people standing behind you screaming at you, it's a little nerve-wracking. And these situations can turn violent, I think, fairly quickly. Look at Charles Murray at Middlebury, where he was assaulted. One of his associates had to go to the hospital with, I think, a broken collarbone. So there's a risk now. Does a school have the obligation then to pay for security in these situations? And I think there is, unfortunately, the answer is yes. Uh, it's not a good use of money to be dropping all these dollars to keep speakers safe from speakers who are acting normally and the students are acting reasonably. But I still think there's an obligation, right? So now we move forward, right? They're standing right behind me. And what you'll see is they weren't just content to stand behind me. They were content to interrupt me. So I actually didn't say anything for several minutes. Okay? I was actually sitting there being quiet. So let's let the audio run a little bit. So the speaker, the president tries introducing me. And they're speaking over him. Now, trying to speak over someone is very difficult. It's very nerve-wracking. It's very unnerving. So if just take a look at their signs. Conservative hate is equal to intellectual debate. Josh Blackman's not welcome here. I am an oppressor. They call me a Nazi. They call me a white supremacist. Right? Keep, keep playing. Well, thank you very much.
much. Thank you for having me. Uh, Please, I'm not even Okay, so I'm going to pause it here. I, I, the clip is an hour long. I have a few minutes, but I want to just explain to you their mindset. They view their campus very much as a safe space. Whatever that term means, that's what they view their campus as. They objected to my mere presence in the building. They could have gone anywhere. They could have left the room. They could have gone somewhere else to talk about their own things, but they objected to my presence even being there. And the reason why is they actually thought that my words were harmful. For example, uh, I've written that I think the travel ban, for example, was a lawful policy. I think it was a terrible idea, but it was within the president's power. I've written that DACA, for example, is unconstitutional. I think it's a good policy if Congress were to enact the DREAM Act, but the president can't do it through executive action. They were convinced that because I took these positions, I was nothing more than a white supremacist, and I didn't belong on their campus. Now, I want to fast forward to one scene in particular that I think embodies the sort of closed-mindedness that these students have. Let me just play it right around here. And for a member of Congress, I would vote you for the Dream Act. My position is that the policy itself is not considered the world law. Which teaches a lesson, right? The lesson is this. You can support something as a matter of policy, but then find that the law doesn't permit it. And then the answer is to change the law. Y'all heard that? Can I, can, I, can I curse at Notre Dame? Is that, is that permissible? <laughs> Fuck it. So, this, <laughs> so one student shouted out, Fuck the law. And these are law students. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't want you to just laugh at them or with them for that matter. I want you to understand their position, and I, I mean this sincerely. Uh, as crazy as it is, I actually get them, right? I actually understand where they're coming from because they told me afterwards. And they, they believe, and I think their position is not without grievance that the law is inherently unjust. And that speakers who uh, uh, argue about the law as if it was some sort of neutral, objective matter um, are actually dangerous. They said I was spreading hate speech and the like. Where I think they went awry was instead of presenting themselves in a way to challenge me and ask questions, they sought to shout me down. And what I did was I tried to engage them and ask them questions. They were utterly unable to actually respond, which led to the fuck the law comment. So I'll play this one clip and I'll move on and we'll sit down in a bit. But I want you to just watch this one clip. <laughs> Okay, and that's the last clip I'm going to play. Um, there are a lot of speakers, look at a Milo Yiannopoulos perhaps, who come on campus for a very specific purpose. Their purpose is to provoke, to instigate, to make people angry and get a reaction to think, put this clip on YouTube. That is a very small sliver of the speakers. There are a large number of speakers who are right of center, who aren't coming on campus to spread propaganda and hate and making divisions. But these students are unable or maybe ill-equipped to distinguish between speakers trying to share ideas they disagree with and speakers trying to get a, uh, get a rise out of them. And they simply assumed that I was in the Milo camp. Now, why do I mention this point? Law schools, I think, have an obligation, and all colleges have a duty, to expose their students to a wide range of perspectives and a wide range of views. If all these students ever see about conservatism is what's on Fox News or on cable news or talk radio, they have almost like a stereotype view of what this is. There is some sort of intellectualism on the right, perhaps, not as much today as I hoped there would be, but it still does exist. This is where universities have an obligation to ensure that speakers can come on campus. That's the first point. Second, ensure that they can be heard. If these students had listened to me for maybe three minutes, they would have realized that their signs were wrong, that I'm not here to spread white supremacism. Right? And the third point, once these students engage in this conduct, what is the role of discipline? 
Now, I can tell you these students were not disciplined in any way, shape, or form. Nothing happened to them. Their faces are on camera. I can tell you exactly where they are. The school did nothing. So what signal does it send to them for the future? That they can go to campus, shout down a speaker, and nothing will happen to them. They are literally sealing themselves off from ideas that they may find harmful. They won't even listen to what I have to say. Now, there's a happy ending, and I'll finish up here. I know I'm short on time. There was one student in the back holding up a sign that said, Josh Blackman, you are an oppressor. An oppressor? Me. Look at me, right? I'm an oppressor. My students, maybe at grading time, think I'm an oppressor, but <laughs> you know, you're an oppressor. He emailed me back at the end of the day. See, after this commotion with the protesters, they left. They walked out of the room because they couldn't handle it. But I took questions and answers for an hour, a solid hour. And they asked me at everything, originalism, textualism, federalism, separation of powers, affirmative action, criminal reform, everything. I took all their questions and I gave them honest answers. And they saw that I'm not some sort of nut job. But they had to stay and listen to me. If they stood outside there and protesting, they wouldn't have heard a word I said. If they shouted at me, they would not have heard a word I said. And that student holding up the sign saying that you are an oppressor, he emailed me. And he made a very lawyerly argument. He said, I, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, I no longer have enough evidence to conclude that you are an oppressor. <laughs> like, I shifted the burden, I suppose, right? The <laughs> preponderance, right? No, so it wasn't quite preponderance of evidence, right? So, you know, Cipro. So I was like, OK, good. I made a mark on at least one human being. And that's what happens with discourse. But when you have a notion of safe space, however you define it, and people will just seclude themselves, won't listen to certain ideas, you don't have that interaction. You don't have the ability to change minds when you're not listening. And there's all this stuff online, you can watch videos, but the human interaction, you ask me a question, I give you an answer right back. That is valuable. And that's why I do what I do. And I'd go right back to CUNY anytime. Thank you very much. I turn it to Dr. Fuentes for his remarks. Oh, I'm trapped. There we go. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you, sir. I want to thank, uh, uh, thank the Con Studies and the ACLU Club and everyone else who is responsible for enabling this. It's a really important conversation. Um, I'm going to take my uh, first moments here, uh, and thank you, uh, Professor Blackman, for presenting us with this sort of a template to talk about. I'm going to present my first few moments here, not responding directly to this, but actually first acknowledging the clear and critical importance of the role of free speech um, and the potentially problematic nature of protests, acknowledging that and acknowledging this specific context, but illustrating clearly that this is not about individual instances. This is about context, assumptions, and a much larger uh, purview. I'm going to use the PowerPoint in a moment here. So, <laughs> so what is this larger context? What actually am I talking about? To understand why protests happen on campus, you have to understand the world in which we live, the society in which we engage, and in which the students are bringing with them to campus. So, first off, the landscape of inequality is real, discrimination is pervasive and powerful. Racism, sexism, bias, and inequality create very unequal experiences and different perceptions of and relationships with USA society for different groups, for different individuals. Um, this is not just uh, me saying this. I mean, we have massive amounts of data that represent substantial inequality uh, racially in the United States, in incarceration rates, in annual wealth of, uh, accumulation, in infant mortality rates, in uh, massive uh, patterns of segregation, um, and in incredible bias in the sense of medical context, in the sense of buying cars, renting apartments, um, in the sense of assessments of legislators, of university faculty, and even of auctions on, uh, on eBay. Right? Systemic and dynamic racism and discrimination is a part of the United States society. And it's not just about race, it's also about inequality, economic inequality. We have lost 50% of our upward mobility in the lower economic range in the United States over the past uh, 60 years. Um, there's enormous, well-documented discrimination and violence towards women, uh, and increasingly uh, large hate crimes uh, in the United States, uh, particularly in the recent few years. That's a context. It's a context you can't ignore. Thinking about challenging certain types and contents of speech is not simply the attack 
the idea of attacking ideologies or ideas one does not like or one finds offensive. I teach things I disagree with all the time. It's part of learning. The current movement to speak up, speak out, and not shut up, that is to protest, is about opposing the intentional propagation of lies, misrepresentations, and deliberate assertions that seek to deny or remove the rights of others, to insult or harm particular groups, and to maintain and reinforce structures of inequity and violence that do harm to our society. Those structures are there, and many people see those structures reflected in particular patterns of speech. People of color, women, LGBTQ folks, differentially abled, and others who are exposed to systemic inequality experience valid sensations of discrimination, aggression, and othering. Even if those individuals acting to instigate and create those events or contexts are not aware of the effect and impact of their actions. Copious data from across multiple disciplines demonstrates that implicit bias and active structures of discrimination are deeply embedded in the daily realities of the United States of America. However, under the guise of free speech, and this is what we need to sort of examine, there are many who intentionally use their speech to attack to deny rights and validity to, and to otherwise intentionally harm others. So, those who are not in the categories that I've just outlined who are targeted, who are not on the receiving end of the structures of discrimination and bias existing in our society, and who are not listening to the voices and experiences of those disadvantaged in our system, well, those people may be in fact perpetuating these systems of discrimination and disadvantage by ignorantly insisting that the playing field is flat. It is not. Claiming that those who feel attacked by certain speech are being snowflakes or should just tough it out misses the reality of differential experience and denies the validity of the voices of those who are disadvantaged in our society. Given what we know, what our own government and countless academic studies demonstrate, if one believes that specific words and speech in the context of systems of racism, sexism, homophobia, and many other forms of violence have no power, then that person has no idea what the hell they're talking about. Ursula Ginn, a wonderful uh, author and daughter of a famous anthropologist, summarizes this point nicely. This is not to say that people invited to a university campus to speak cannot have racist, homophobic, and misogynistic views. They can. I wouldn't invite such folks. But there are many people who would. But freedom of speech does not mean that those individuals who are unfairly at risk from such speech cannot be offered spaces of protection when they're enabled to participate or engage with others in the context free of direct targeting. It also does not mean that these folks cannot demonstrate, protest, or use their freedom of speech to counter the injustice they are experiencing. In this context, I think it's very important as we move forward into the discussion here to think about the context of speeches. Not everyone is protested justly. But the reasons for those protesters at CUNY, why they thought they were being attacked, because of the context in which they live, exist, and the context that's playing out, that has to be part of the conversation. The question I really have regarding this whole topic of free speech is not should there be safe spaces or should there be free speech. Of course, there should be both. Rather, what I really want to know is why are there individuals in centers of higher learning who are hell-bent on invoking something called free speech as a weapon to create context where specific speech is brought to bear with the intention of harming others, reinforcing discriminatory practices, and bolstering the erroneous and misguided ideologies that seek to maintain and expand racist, sexist, homophobic, and other unjust and unscientific perspectives. That's what I'm really interested in. And I think it's a damaging context to discuss free speech, safe space, and this broader element without thinking about the context in which we live. Individual events are important, but if they're not placed in context, then they do not inform us, and they do not allow us to engage in uh, the broader discourse. With that, I'll leave it, and we can actually have some discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take a few minutes more. Yeah, sure. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, I, I think Professor Fuentes makes a fair point, and I agree with him in large measure. Uh, the students at CUNY, I think, had legitimate grievances. I will not dispute this. I teach at a fairly diverse law school. I speak around the country. I, I've learned a lot 
from these students. And in fact, the students who stuck around and asked me hard questions pointed out some of the same sort of data points concerning inequity in society. So I, I get that. My point's a little bit more abstract. The idea of a safe space, however we define it, we haven't had to define it yet, but if it means a single room where people can go and talk amongst themselves without fear of being persecuted, I think I'd have less of an objection to it. But the students at CUNY had a much broader definition. They basically wanted a safe campus. Um, their perspective was very clear that I didn't have a space on their campus. In fact, a number of their signs, I can, there are a lot of signs, like a 40 but when the sign says, you are not welcome on our campus, this is a safe space. And they basically said this to me very upfront. Um, and the perspective of this is not only that they needed a place for them to be by themselves, but that my mere existence harmed them. My words would harm them. And here's where I think that this, this doctrine goes awry. If they're not willing to listen to me speak for three minutes to identify that maybe I'm not the person they think I am, then it perpetuates their conceptions that are justified but may not be accurate. And unless you actually have a discussion with people, you don't learn. And for the students that did stick around and did argue with me and yell at me and debate me, they got something out of it. Now, the last point I'll make is, um, I think we both also agree people have a right to protest, uh, but where do you draw the line, right? And this is a line I actually struggle with a lot. I don't have a clear answer for you all, right? At what point do those students engage in conduct that warrants discipline, or did they, right? They disrupted my event for eight or seven minutes, however you want to count it, it's hard to count. But I went on and I did other stuff. Or did I? I never gave the lecture I wanted to give. I went to Q&X, I, I couldn't do it. Uh, I might have looked pretty calm and composed up there, but I was pretty scared. Uh, my mom saw it, I didn't notice it, my hand was shaking, right? It's fairly de uh, uh, unnerving to be <laughs> presenting with this ruckus around you. So was I disrupted? Put yourself in my shoes. If you had been told there are 40 people protesting, would you have simply left and not went down that hallway? Would you have gone home? Maybe. Would anyone go back to CUNY knowing this is what might await them? Does that discourage future speakers? Because there will be no discipline? Uh, if you had walked in and people started shouting, would you have left the room? I mean, it's an honest question. I don't have an answer. This is for your own judgment and your own sense of morality. Uh, but is the heckler's veto, as it called, dependent on how <laughs> stupid a person like me is to keep fighting, keep pushing through? Or is it based on perhaps what a reasonable person would say, this is not a good place to present? So I think there's a lot of agreement with us. Uh, I think we would disagree is the general notion of uh, what is impermissible conduct in response to these uh, uh, inequities within our society. Thank you so much. Please. Thanks, Dr. Blackburn. I think that's a, that's a very good way to frame this. Um, because it is that question is um, not only what is permissible, but how do we conceptualize our discourse on freedom of speech? Um, I, think, I think you brought up something very important here. Uh, and that is the notion that um, how do we as a speaker or we as an audience take a particular context. In the case at CUNY, I think what's very important here is that the, the, the sort of premise of the conversation was on DACA, right? And, and it was actually on free speech. Oh, that was the topic, the, topic. the irony. So they ended up talking about DACA, but the context for why the students engaged in this is because of previous work. And then you clarified, I think, very uh, effectively. What we have to understand is you did a great job, I think, of identifying that you felt threatened. Right? I'm safe in some sense in that context, and that's absolutely true. But students who may be undocumented, or students who may be of different groups on which the topic you're discussing, in that context, in the law school, also may be feeling threatened when a position of power, when a professor is coming to present information that says they don't have the rights that they hope that they would. And I think that's an important, we have to keep this in play. And so when we ask who gets to decide speech, I, I'm all for students inviting speakers. I think that's incredible. I think students do a better job than faculty. But what is protest is permissible and what should be the role of discipline? Uh, that is I'd really like to hear from the student audience what they think about that. What I really want to just sort of end on here is that if we engage in this conversation without thinking about context of all involved, if we think there is some bottom line that no matter what, words cannot do the damage 
Uh, I think we're really, really short selling what words do. And we're also replicating an ignorance about the systems of inequality that permeate US society. And I think without thinking through that, we really aren't able to engage effectively in this discourse on freedom of speech. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for a model of reason uh, discourse. Uh, I'm going to sure. turn it over sure. to Q&A uh, in just a second. Let me pose, I want to take a theme that I think ran through both of your uh, uh, remarks and uh, maybe get you to comment on it, and then we'll turn to, turn to Q&A. Um, uh, I think Professor Fuentes said that, look, uh, free speech, yes, but also uh, not speech that attack people's rights, people's existence, insults. Um, how do you resolve the, the difficulty that one person's argument is another person's insult? Yeah. Right? Uh, I'll, I'll take, uh, hopefully not an insulting uh, uh, topic here, but uh, an example I use in my undergraduate class, legacy admissions mm -hmm. for undergraduates. Right? Are they just and fair? And lots of people would say, no, I mean, just because your parents went here, you should have no claim on a space, uh, uh, a rare commodity getting into the University of Notre Dame or other. But those arguments for some students will translate them as, you don't belong here. And everyone knows if you're a legacy or not. Right. Now that's, I don't know how you have an argument without maybe implicitly or uh, uh, unintentionally insulting someone. Yeah. yeah. But what do we do in that situation? Yeah. Where it's hard to draw yeah. the line between an argument and a, an insult. Yeah. And even an insult that says, an argument that says, you don't belong here. Yeah, I, I teach constitutional law, and this is a tough class, because almost every case I teach directly affects a person. I'll start with DACA. I've had Dreamer students who benefited from this program, and I understand that when I talk about the legal issues in class, that impacts them directly. Impacts maybe their family or their friends who receive this status. I've written about the travel ban. I have Muslim students. And I recognize that the arguments I'm making impact them or perhaps their family and their friends. I've written about Obamacare. I once had a debate on the Affordable Care Act's constitutionality where a student said, if it wasn't for the Obamacare law, my mom would be dead. I, I get these arguments. Um, and they're not trivial arguments, right? Law affects people in profound ways, whether it's immigration or health care. I have debated gun control, and someone says, my son was killed by gun violence. That was the beginning of the debate. I, I can go on for this for a while. If you're sensing a pattern, I take all these controversial positions. Um, what I try to do, at least in my own classroom, which is tough, is to teach students to separate the law and the policy. That you can have a strong view on the legal question and still think it's a good policy, right? You might think that the travel ban is awful, it's immoral. But Congress gave the president that power, and that's all the courts can look at. It's very tough to do that. And I try to teach my students whether they succeed or not, uh, I'll, let, I'll let them decide. But when you come on campus for like a hit, right? I'm here just for an hour, here today, gone tomorrow. You don't see me ever again. You can't build that kind of rapport. And all the students can see is the top line of your article saying DACA is unconstitutional or that travel ban is lawful, whatever it happens to be. And what I tried to do, and if you watch a video, was to try to articulate the distinction between law and policy. And I find that's an effective medium for me to talk about controversial topics. And at the end of the day, you do not agree with my position on the Establishment Clause or uh, the Take Care Clause, whatever clause of the Constitution, that's fine. But then we can say, we'll separate how this affects you. But we can always talk about that afterwards, right? But, but understand the distinct issues. That's not a good answer, but that's what I try to do sincerely in my own te teaching when I'm on the road. I think this, I just want to use my last slide here, if this will work. I think this is a really important point. Um, and I don't want to stand up because you weren't standing up, but that slide there will clearly, that's a little power differential. The slide the power there, point differential. Right, right, right. <laughs> Makes my point. <laughs> oh, good, good. The, the, Everything we just used or heard examples, I agree with. These are good examples, but they're individual examples, and I'm talking about systemic context. And that might be the difference between a legal approach and anthropological or social science approach. So what uh, Idioma Oluo's definition here is absolutely critical because this is defining racism as 
prejudice against someone because of race when those views are reinforced by systems of power. So there are tons of jerks out there of every kind. But when you're a jerk and that jerkism is reinforced by a system of power, it has a differential impact and a differential way of affecting. And so when we think about these contexts and we say we can talk about it, actually, not always. It is not always equally available to sit down and have these conversations because the playing field is not flat. People cannot, because of their own systemic discrimination, always be able to engage in the kind of productive discourse that we idealize, that we hope to engage in. And so what do we do? Well, the definition of safe space then should be broadened to think about not just is there speech or not, but how do we engage in speech? And how do we develop this speech? And how do we mediate the potential deleterious impacts of speech without cutting off the speech? So how do we create dynamics of intercourse right, where we can actually acknowledge and try to ameliorate these differential access and differential equity components so that we can have the conversation. And I think that is the kind of safe space that universities need. And that's the kind of safe space that I think is problematized by sort of focusing continuously on individual examples as opposed to systemic systems of inequity. Dr. Prentice, can I follow up on yeah, this? Yeah, absolutely. So what, what does that mean um, for the classroom space? Mm -hmm. I mean, so there are different spaces on university. You might be a dorm room or a dorm lounge different than a classroom. Let's just focus on the classroom itself. Does that mean that given uh, uh, inequalities, systematic inequalities, that some questions or some points of view can't be, be articulated in the classroom? No, I think that we have to think carefully and in depth how we articulate them. Right? So uh, when I teach a class on race and racism or sex and sexuality, I spend a lot of time trying to think about language, trying to think about how to invite participation, but also to moderate and modulate that participation with an eye towards the dem demography and experiences within the room. It's an enormous amount of work to really have free speech. And I, and I think, I think so that's... the context of a particular classroom will be important. Context of a particular classroom and topics are extremely important, but it's huge work for the instructor and the students to open themselves up to recognizing unequal landscapes and then working towards that. And I think these are the kinds of things that emerge, say, post the initial protest when you're actually talking with people. If you can find ways to do that, it works. But we don't spend enough time debating how to do that. We spend more time debating, well, is this right or is this wrong? And I, I think that's a mistake. OK, let's, we have to end at 1.30 sharp. Uh, and I want to get in as many questions uh, from the students as mm -hmm. possible. So well, what I'll ask is, one, actually ask a question and keep it free. <laughs> and then I'm going to ask our, our, our uh, participants here to, act, to try to make your responses as, as succinct as possible, just in the interest of hearing as many voices as possible. So tell us uh, who you are, where you are at, at Notre Dame, or from the community, and your name as well. Uh, Sure, yeah. My name is Tony. I'm from Uganda and I'm in the ALM International Human Rights. And my question goes to Professor Blackman. If you are called an oppressor, like you said by the student, would you have any remedy? Are you protected by the First Amendment or, or the protection there is? for other categories. Now, my question is, would you maybe choose if you are chosen to take action, would you have been successful? Are you talking like a libel or defamation action? Yes. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> well, you know, the, <laughs> the defense of defamation is if it's a false statement, right? Um, I considered it briefly for five seconds. I don't think that'd be a worthwhile endeavor. They call me a Nazi, even worse. I'm not a member of the Nazi party. I've never been a member. So I think that'd be a more actual, a more actual claim of libel, per se. Um, but I don't begrudge them, and I mean this sincerely. They, they had, I think, a misconception of who I was. They didn't get to know me, and they made these generalizations about me. Many of the same things they accused me of doing, they, they did. Uh, and those who actually stuck around to get to know me had, I think, a different understanding of me at the end of the day. Uh, but if all you read about someone is this a top line, you know, I, I didn't mention this in the talk, but they put together some opposition research on me. They, they pass out these flyers on campus with about 10 or 15 things I had said and written completely out of context to make me look like the second coming of, you know, you know, George Wallace, right? They, 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 they really 
put these things together in a way that was, I think, very unfair and inaccurate. And a lot of students just picked this up, oh yeah, okay, here, let's make signs that go Blackman, a Nazi, an oppressor, and a fascist, and a white supremacist. Um, that wasn't any sort of discourse. And Professor Fuentes, I think, does a good job with the students of modulating, I like the word, modulating the, the discourse. This is all one-sided. They were, they were targeting in on, a, on, I think, on a fiction. So no, I'm not going to sue them for defamation. I wouldn't consider it for a second. Uh, I would probably win, maybe on the Nazi claim. But uh, you know, I, 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 hell. my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. right? Not that that mattered. I didn't actually bring that up. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a jarring sentiment to have these people lob accusations at you that are so far removed from reality when their objection is overgeneralization and prejudice. It, it, it's, I, I don't like to use the word irony because irony is dead, but it, 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 it's dead. But, it, it, but it, it, it's a bizarre sentiment. And I, I appreciate your question, and maybe we'll discuss New York Times or Sullivan. I'm not a public figure, thankfully. Uh, but, you know, uh, but I don't think I'd, I'd go bring the action. Nothing. Just really quickly, I think this is a good example, though, too, of talking about access and privilege, right? Because when we get invited someplace to go speak, we're professors and we're paid to go speak there. We are in a position of privilege. I got stuff yelled at me a, a lot. I, I haven't had that specific example, but I've had some, you know, severe threats and a variety of other kinds of things. So what? I'm a full professor, right? Yeah. I have every yeah. privilege on the planet in the world of academy. If I can't deal with that and recognize maybe what's going on, then I'm not doing my job as a scholar. Yeah, and tenure is important too. I got yeah. funny story. My tenure vote was a day before the CUNY event, I swear. <laughs> I, I it told you, like, I was tenured about 48 hours before the CUNY event. I'm like, OK, cool. <laughs> OK. When I called my dean, that was a fun conversation. I'm, like, I'm done. <laughs> Context as a debatable piece of the conversation. Yeah. Did everyone hear the question? Yeah. The, the question was about uh, the, the use of social science data as, as statistics and whether the context itself is up for debate. Mm -hmm. so, I, I mean, that's a really, really good question. And so, what I did as a standard debate trick was I wanted to make a point in a very small amount of time. So I showed you a bunch of numbers. Those numbers are accurate and they reflect something, but without actual context for the numbers, they're just a bunch of numbers to impress you, right? That's called making your point without getting in there. Now, every one of those things, I actually research much of that area. So I could have broke down, if I had a much longer time, the sort of misguided notion of the biological differences of race, but the real components of racism causing biological impact. I could have talked about historical, political, and economic trajectories in the United States of America that have created classes of individuals that are structurally disadvantaged. So, I mean, there's an enormous amount of data there, but I mean, you, I did, you know, the quick seven minute version of it. So in that context, what I meant to present was, look, there's a big context out there that should be debated. I didn't mean to debate that context. But I think context has to be debated because if we move away from the big picture and what is actually the scenario in which we are playing out this debate about free speech, then it all becomes about events and individuals. And that's problematic because that's no way to make assumptions. And I think I'm not a lawyer or a law student, but I'm hoping that's not a way to make law either. So stand up so the people in the back can hear you and speak loudly. Please. So Dr. Fuentes, you addressed the very eloquently the idea that we should be seeking to minimize the differential impact that these different systems of power are having in our discourses, and especially gave what I thought was a very rich way of looking at positive and constructive civil discourse. But my question is, who is to decide and how are we to decide what is actually offensive mm. in these discourses? Yeah. If offense is given, even if inadvertently, what are we to do about that? You That's forget, a great yeah, you go yeah, on it. Yeah. So I think this is, and uh, Professor Blackman said, who gets to decide uh, what is protest permissible and how do we discipline? I think those are incredibly important questions. So how do we uh, uh, discuss what you just mentioned? But I would change one word because I'm not talking about offense. I'm talking about harm. And I think those two things are very importantly different because offense, we can all get offended a variety of different kinds of things. 
But what we have to recognize is substantial physiological, right, medical, social science, and biological data sets that demonstrate the real embodied implications and repercussions of inequality, and discrimination, racism, bigotry. I'm not saying in every context that happens, but if we use the term offense only, like people get bent out of shape in these kind of contexts, we diminish the actual potential impact that this discourse can have. And so I agree with you. I think we need to figure out in these debates, how do we measure it? How do we understand that? But without data, without understanding of what the landscape looks like, we can't even begin that discussion. So what I like to see is students getting together from diverse backgrounds and diverse contexts and thinking this through. Because professors, we all have a very vested interest, right, in promoting a particular paradigm, whereas students are the ones that can push us to think more along these lines and figure out, well, how do we define this? How do we lay it out? But I would be very, very clear, this is not just about people taking offense. It's about actual psychological and physiological potential harm. You know, a number of the protesters use that word. They said, your speech harms us. They said, your, your, my speech, Josh, my speech hurts you. Um, I don't have any knowledge in psychological trauma. Uh, I will defer to experts on this. Um, my point's a little more broad. In the legal profession, um, there's a lot of injustice, right? If you ever go into criminal defense in particular, you're going to see some pretty awful stuff. Um, to the extent that we're cabining education to minimize harm to people, that certain lectures or speeches may, may minimize their harm, my pedagogical question is, are we deserving students in some respect, right? What are we denying them that they may not learn? And I'll give a, a, an easy example. Um, in criminal law, uh, a fairly common crime is rape. Um, some professors will not teach rape in criminal law because the topic is too harmful. My professor in law school didn't teach it. I had to cram it for the bar. I just I had never learned it before. Um, but what happens when you have entire areas of law in which students are obligated to know about it if they go into defense of criminal law, and the teacher won't discuss it because it might be too harmful? Are you deserving your students? Now, I teach con law. I hit every topic. Abortion, eugenics, sodomy, slavery. Just go down my syllabus. I hit every single topic. And almost any lecture can use your language, perhaps harm a student's psyche, right? When I teach Dred Scott, that's not an easy class, right? There are people who I think are, who tell me after class that they're in tears, that this, this harms them, and I, and I get it. So then what's the response? Do we not teach it? Do we teach it in a different fashion? Do we, <laughs> do we, do we perhaps teach it in a way that it's demographically different? I, I don't, I don't know, maybe there's some way to engineer this with the right student groups and the right diversity. I don't have an answer, uh, but I try to approach it as carefully and honestly as I can. And I tell my students that when you get out there, when you graduate, you're gonna be facing a pretty, pretty harsh world. And this is, in some ways, practice to get you acclimated. I don't have a good answer, but I do think uh, I try to, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't pull punches in my classroom. I don't take things off the syllabus because it might be uh, 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 harmful. Let me just point out, this. I, I think uh, that's admirable and I think that's very important, but the terminology, pulling punches, the real world is this way, that is specifically assuming that, well, you know, everyone is more or less capable. Because do you want to say, if we accept dramatic inequality in the real world, what you're saying is that these clusters of students, I'm not preparing in the same way that I'm preparing these clusters of students because of that context. Mm -hmm. And so I think it behooves us as instructors to rethink how we do pedagogy, to rethink how we teach, not to cut it out of the syllabus or the content, but to think that there's got to be a way that we can reshape this such that everyone coming out of our class has at least a closer to equity, not equity, we're never going to get there, but a closer to equity chance coming out. Because if someone is harmed and someone is not harmed from these contents, when they go into this real world, they're going to be less prepared than others. And so I think it, it, it behooves us to, to do that work. Can I kind of play devil's advocate yeah. yeah. here and say to both you guys, uh, come on. I mean, the students got to toughen up. Give me a break. I mean, this, uh, we're, we're so ratcheting what's harmful that, um, you know, I teach Dred Scott. It's not that. I mean, you might not like it, but really reading a Supreme Court opinion from 150 years ago is harmful? Come on. I'll, I'll let him take that one. Reading. <laughs> it's actually a case about diversity jurisdiction, 
It, it should be a CIF pro case, if nothing else. It's about who's assistant of a state and, anyway, go on. Yeah, it's a diversity case. This is an the, argument you hear. No, 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 I know. It's a very common one. It's an, an argument from privilege. It's an argument, and I'm not saying, you know, cut everything, hold everyone's hand. I'm saying be aware of the impact and the content. Look at your classroom. And when you are talking about, for example, radical origins of discriminatory practice that have huge impact on the lives, the histories, and the bodies of a particular group of people, think about that when you're delivering your lecture. Think about the way you frame it. Think about that context. Because if you don't, you are saying, here's just the data. This is just the facts. And a cluster of your class is like, yeah, OK, I get that. And the other cluster is like, but this is me. But this is my ancestry. This is my body. This explains a whole context of why I feel the way I do when I walk out these doors. And if, we don't be, if we're not aware of that, then we're doing a disservice to the propagation of knowledge and the access that we hope our students have to improving our society rather than just replicating what's already done. Well, let's get some more questions here. Uh, Please, sir. Stand up so we can all hear you again. Hello, uh, my name is Carlos. I'm a JSD student here at the law school at the Center for Civil and Human Rights. And my question is for Professor Blackman, particularly. You seem in your initial intervention to distinguish between law and politics, mm -hmm. saying, for instance, that, well, I'm just teaching the law how it is, and afterwards I'm not discussing politics in, in general per se. But that is a question that is highly in, you know, part of positive law in the sense that we can make that distinguish uh, or, or that comparison not be the real impact because sometimes law is the result of bad politics. And it takes away a whole contextual issue in the sense of how people think of law, the history of law, the colonial system of law, in particular for countries in Latin America, for instance, or other countries in Africa towards Asia, et cetera, and my interest in which is international law. In that sense, do you think that's the easy way out? Because you, you seem to know that your speech can harm, but you say it's an only law. So it's, it's, it's an easy way out of saying, no, I'm only teaching what is law, without taking into consideration the whole contextual nature of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question, Carlos. I appreciate it. Um, one of their pamphlets that handed out said, legal objectivity is a myth. Right, and that they were actually chanting that legal objectivity is a myth. That's one of their one of their, their slogans. Um, I can have an entire debate, maybe invite back to Notre Dame next semester on is legal objectivity a myth, but I will keep it enough here to say that I think there is law that does exist separate from policy. They intersect a lot. There's a lot of overlap. So, for example, I teach property. Property is a thankfully boring class, right? The rules in property today are the same rules that existed 400 years ago. It's a very stable topic, and I love teaching property, because I can give you an answer today that was correct in the same time as Henry VIII, the same, the same exact answer. Okay. Common law, I can't do that for, right? Common law is a class where I think there is some law, but a lot of it's based on the um, philosophies of the justices of the US Supreme Court who decide very important questions. And in my class, I make very clear that you do have to understand each justice and how they approach the Constitution. Now, you say that's just politics. I think that's actually law. Law embraces judicial philosophy. Um, I don't take the position that judges are just partisans in robes. Um, <laughs> perhaps a bad week to make that statement. But you know, I, I don't, I don't, no, actually, I don't like being, no. Uh, uh, I don't take that position. I do try and teach my students there is a distinction between law and policy. Now, they can disagree with me and say, Blackman, you're wrong. And OK, I can't, I can't fight them on this. But uh, I am a positivist, to use your word. Uh, I do believe that there is law unique, and that's why I try to teach it. If I believe that legal objectivity is a myth, I would drop out and run for Congress and say, screw it. But I think there's law to teach, and I'm trying to teach it. By the way, when, members, when law professors do run for Congress, I think it's actually a good thing. So, you know, get your priorities straight. Okay. <laughs> Let's get as many, uh, five minutes left, as many comments as possible. Please, man, in the back. Um, so, uh, you mentioned that you have a question. Oh, yeah. And, uh, well, I went to Texas a and I was there with a professor yeah. um, who's a self-professed white nationalist. And so um, that is a person in that way. Do you all have there? So would you just say that in those speech is too harmful to have on campus? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I, again, I teach in Houston, so I have some Aggies in my class. And they were there when Spencer was, was teaching. One thing that Richard Spencer, this is just basically a neo-Nazi, he's not being invited. He's renting space in many cases, right? <coughs> Was he, did the actual student group invite him? 
All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll separate it. So when, if a student group actually wants to invite Richard Spencer, I think the remedy is you protest the hell out of him outside and you ask him some really tough questions. Um, challenge him, show people that he's bad. The worst alternative is to uninvite him because when you uninvite a speaker, you create this mystique, this allure is like, well, maybe I should be listening to this guy, right? You can always hear him speak on YouTube, but the value of having him in your premise, on your campus, is that you can engage him. And I'll give you an easy example. When I was in college, I was fairly conservative. I'm not a libertarian, you wouldn't know it. I'm pretty libertarian. Um, and uh, I used to be a big Ann Coulter fan. You know, everyone knows Ann Coulter, right? <laughs> Ann Coulter came to Penn State where I was at college, and she was giving a lecture. There I went, I saw it. And I bought all of her books, I was so excited. And then I asked her some question about Israel. I can't remember what the question was, but I asked her some question about Israel. And she goes, America is Israel's pimp. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, that's idiotic. Why did you say that? It was, an, it was some question about whatever the conflict was at the time. I can't even remember. And I said, you know what? Screw that. I'm not buying your book anymore. <laughs> I stopped buying your books. She lost a fan that day, right? It's amazing when you see someone with a bad speaker. It's like, screw this. I'm not doing this anymore, right? So there's value in having an idiot on your campus and then seeing, wow, this guy's an idiot, versus just saying, oh, he's on YouTube, I'm not going to watch his videos. So even with Spencer, I would have him speak, but protest the heck out of him. I actually disagree because I think Spencer's argument is to take away rights for others, to promote racism, to cause harm to others. I would say storm the room and shut him down. Listen, we've got three minutes. So I'm going to take three questions right in a row and then okay. do what we can with them. Yeah, so, good idea. So right here, I'm Brandon, I'm a law student. Um, this is for particularly Professor Fuentes. Um, isn't the argument uh, of your conception of uh, privilege and harm constantly self-defeating? Uh, for example, me being an uh, undergraduate at the University of Michigan, I was a prominent conservative, and I had to go under police protection because the privileged people on campus were the campus left, and they were and they were causing harm to me. So isn't that just a constantly self-defeating argument without absolutism? OK, let's get another question. Uh, oh. really <laughs> he can't hold it in. The left. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. My name's Henry, and I have a question from the Fluster Back Fund. Um, you, in the, your opening speech, you separate and distinguish yourself from other kinds of speakers who may be a little more inflammatory. How would you respond to those speakers who are asserting your argument of that they have a free speech right to also come onto campus and make those kinds of speeches? Thank you. So really quickly, uh, two quick things. Um, uh, you know, that doesn't sound like a good experience for you at Michigan, but you as an individual in the United States are not under a system of power of oppression globally or writ large. So you might have been in one context, but I will, there's plenty of data that suggests that right-wing individuals, right, are not suffering from systemic inequality and oppression within the United States. Um, so there's a longer conversation. No, look at the data. There, there's very significant data to support that. Um, and yes, students have enormous responsibility. Um, students have to work very hard in class, and I feel frequently students abdicate that responsibility waiting for the professor to provide it for them, and, and I think students should be much more active uh, than they are. Okay, I think it's my last remark. Um, I do think students do have an obligation, um, and you are in college, you're in university, you have a role to seek out ideas that you disagree with, and this is something I believe in firmly. Um, as a conservative member in a predominantly liberal fashion, I'm always the outsider. I'm usually invited as the token, so to speak. It's almost this weird system where they invite me because I don't give a contrary view, which is fine. It actually doesn't bother me. So I don't have a problem hearing views I disagree with. But for the average college student on, a, on any college campus, you're not going to hear that. So seek it out. If there's a speaker coming on campus that you think this guy's wrong, go ask him some hard questions. You might learn something, or you might not. But always seek out ideas. That's why you're in school. I want to thank uh, the ACLU group, yeah, uh, the Federalist Society, and especially our speakers for just a model of reasoned dialogue. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, that is good. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was wonderful.